going to keep talking now a little bit more about vacuum. Uh, and I want to talk a little bit now about specific best practices, how to actually apply vacuum to get the results that we get. Quickly, there's a big difference between pulling a vacuum when you have a brand new system going in and pulling a vacuum when you're in service, so you're replacing a part within the refrigerant circuit, okay? Um, a couple things that aren't vacuum related that you need to think about at least, like we talked about flushing the line sets, there's different techniques that can be used to do that. There's no one bad or one good technique, you will get different results depending on the technique you use. But when it comes to using flushes, I just encourage you to look at what is coming out of the end. If nothing's coming out of the end, then the flush didn't do anything, right? So you, you get that, right? It, it all stayed in there. Now it evaporates out, the flush will, the solvent will, or at least it should, we hope, um, but whatever it tried to scrub off the walls, it just left in the lines, and that actually can make it worse. Does that make sense, what I'm saying? So if you use a solvent and it scrubs stuff off the lines, but nothing comes out the end, where is the stuff that it scrubbed off the lines? Still in the lines, <laughs> right? You get that. So that's why I like the, the pig system, the system where you shoot a projectile through because you know that it all comes out. You can watch it all shoot out at the end, okay? Makes sense. Um, the other thing that, uh, what was the other thing I want to mention? Oh, line dryers. Um, line dryers obviously are really important and you can get away with a lot if you have properly installed line dryers. Now you guys are in a straight cool market. You're also in a coastal market, which means that you should be putting your line dryers, when I say should, follow what your leaders tell you here, I'm not trying to oppose anybody, but <clears throat> they, they, they really need to be going inside. They need to be going as close to the indoor metering device as possible. That helps protect it from weather, keeps it from corroding out, and it protects the metering device from whatever's actually already in the lines. So if you have it at the condenser, so imagine you have, you have install your line dryer at the condenser. Now I'm not saying if it's factory installed, you leave it with a factory installed it, okay? Like whatever. But um, you guys install a lot of Bryant, which means that they're shipped with the line dryer. So you have a choice of where you want to put it. You can put it inside, you can put it outside on the liquid line. If you put it outside, it's exposed to weather, it's exposed to more salt, salt air, and anything that's in that liquid line is not going to protect the metering device, which is going to be the first thing it hits, right? So when you start that system up, it's going to be flowing the direction towards the metering device, and it's going to be more likely for stuff to get in there. If you put it outside, I'm not judging you, okay? I'm not, I'm not saying it's terrible, but I know the reason why most people do it is because it's harder to braze on the inside, but you're already brazing on the inside if you're doing a uh, evaporator coil or a new system, which are by far the two most common things that you braze in, right? Does that make sense? Go ahead. Is, is there a reason why it comes with the condenser and not the air? Um, well, is there, uh, the reason is that in, mu in much of the country and in much of the world, um, condenser swaps without changing air handlers or coils is very common. So they want you putting a new line dryer in, even if you're just changing the condenser, the outside unit. Um, but if you look at the installation instructions, where does it tell you to put it? Inside on carrier, at least. Uh, the vast majority tell you to put it inside. Now, you'll have some brands like Daikin and Goodman that put it in, inside the condenser. Why do they do that? Well, they do it to ensure that you get a new line dryer in. Because even though we know you're not supposed to have line dryers in series, you're not supposed to have more than one, the reality is it's better to have them than not to have them in the liquid line, right? Suction line's a different story, right? When we'll talk about that a little bit later, but in the suction line, and actually I don't even know if we have that content in here, but we'll talk about it anyway at some point. In the suction line, any sort of pressure drop in the suction line is really bad for the compressor. Like it increases compression ratios, overheating, all that stuff really bad. Liquid line restrictions, all that happens is your system performance decreases and then eventually, um, eventually you'll start freezing your evaporator coil uh, if they plug up. So it's not like, it's not good, but it's not really bad. Uh, if you get a suction line that plugs up, you'll take a compressor out in no time. Make sense? Cool. All right, so back to, back to evacuation best and worst practices. So uh, changing, swapping a unit, the first thing you have to worry about is just, is my line set as clean as I can get it? Did I blow everything out as best I can? Try to get it, try to get it clear. Uh, but generally speaking, on a change out, you can pull a vacuum, like I said, in under 20 minutes uh, to under 200 microns. And I know that we, or 200 microns or less, and I know you can because we do it every single day of the week. Um, and the way we do it, is, do we have this picture here? I think we do. We can back up to this. The way we do it is we first verify that our pump is working, that it's pulling down deep. We know our pump does its job. 
Uh, number two, we remove the cores. So the cores come out of the system. Now, um, if you're doing this in new installation, we actually do leave in the liquid line core, so opposite of what I just said. We leave in the liquid line core and we connect our micron gauge right to that liquid line core. Now this is after we've already brazed in, we've already purged, we've already done all that stuff that we've already talked about, right? Follow. So now we're just ready to pull vacuum. Um, in this picture here, we, I, we actually show it connecting to a, uh, a core remover tool. And you can do it this way with the core out, but you can also do it with the core in and just use the core depressor on the micron gauge on the liquid line. And then all we do is one big hose right to the pump on the suction line with no core in. Does that make sense? Is that complicated? One big hose. It can be the big blue hose that we show here. It can be the three quarter inch NAVAC hoses that they just came out with. It can be half inch Appian hoses that they just came out with. One big hose. They're not that expensive because all you need is one. This is for installers. Okay? Goes straight to the pump. That's it. Now at that point, where are you measuring your vacuum? You're measuring it on the complete other side, right? So it's on the liquid line. You're pulling on just the suction line. Just, I'm just going to keep saying this. Be one hose, suction line to pump, no core. Other side, liquid line, core still in. This is the way we do it. You can do it this way. Either way is fine. With a micron gauge and you're pulling down. When that micron gauge hits 200, that means that you're at 200 on the furthest point of the system. That means at the pump, you're lower than that. You're even better off at the pump. If you measure at the pump, you don't know what you are on the other side of the system. You've got no clue. And in fact, you're not even going to be close. Here's the cool thing. If you've ever struggled with pulling a vacuum where you pull it and then you valve off and it starts jumping up on you, you pull it, jumps up on you, does this. When you do it this way, when you valve off, when you finally valve off, a lot of times your vacuum will go down a few points before it actually stabilizes, right? Because you have, again, lower vacuum closer to the pump. The pump is pulling uh, lower, deeper vacuum closer to the pump and that's the furthest point. Does that make sense? So, it just, it, it eliminates the false negatives. It eliminates all the issues that you get with installers. All they got to do is get it to 200, and then what do they do to, all, what do they have to do to isolate it? To do an isolation test. One ball valve. Boop. Let it sit. Does it go up? Any significant amount. Now again, it will go up a little tiny bit. Our standard, our standard thing, and this comes back to Carrier used to have a, um, a standard that said pull below 500 microns and then in 10 minutes if it doesn't go above 1,000, you're good. We pull to 200 and if it doesn't go above 500 in 10 minutes, you're good. And that's a pretty, for a residential system, it's got to be pretty tight. Like, it's, if it, like I said, if it was a giant grocery store or something like that, then that isn't enough. But for us, you don't have any significant leaks if you've hit that number. Does that make sense? Now, why is it taking longer for some of you? That's the question. What do you think? Don't pull the cores, use quarter inch hoses. Right. Don't pull the cores, use quarter inch hoses, use your manifold, hooking it up multiple places. A lot of those connections leak. You don't get nearly the flow rates through those quarter inch hoses. And again, a lot of it comes down to misunderstanding the core science of it. Okay, because people are like, why on earth do I need these big hoses? That doesn't make any sense. The ports are only a quarter inch. But again, all of the rules of how we think about flow and pressure and all that stuff, they're very different when you get down to these very, very low pressures where you have very few molecules left. They don't behave um, like they do when you have a lot of pressure and you have more laminar flow or everything's moving. And the best example is, imagine a, a toll booth. Do they have toll booths here? Is that even a thing? The toll, you guys know what a toll booth is though, right? You gotta go down and you pay somebody to go on the road, right? Okay, so, yeah, that's right. You guys don't pay taxes. Like, you don't, you don't pay for anything here. That's amazing. <laughs> I did a right? yeah, grocery store, good point. I have been to, and we went to, we went to the wrong grocery store the first time. What's the real expensive one uh, that's like Whole Foods? Uh, the first one we went, I don't remember which, but we went to the first one, it was like, holy moly, we're not gonna be able to make it out of here. And then we went to a cheaper one and it was okay, so. Um, anyway, yeah, you pay for groceries, that's true. Uh, and power and gas and everything else. Um, so imagine if you have a toll booth, okay? You got a big highway that goes in, you got a toll booth, and then you got a big highway coming out. People, a lot of people will say, well, it doesn't matter what size the hose is because if the port's quarter inch, that's the smallest point, it might as well, hoses might as well be quarter inch. That's the same as saying, well, if a toll booth is only yay wide, then the whole highway should just be that wide because it's just the same. It's not. Molecules behave very much like cars on the road. 
where they're moving around, they're bouncing, they're changing lanes, they're doing all this. And if you have more space, there's less friction. And with less friction, you get a lot more flow. It can move a lot faster. So even if you choke it down, if you open it back up again, you're gonna get better flow. And that's huge when it comes to vacuum, massive. It's also, again, in our, where we are, we do it with recovery too. Around here, that's not much of a, of a conversation about recovery. So, uh, so we wanna get as much of those molecules out as quickly as possible to get to that really deep vacuum. And the way we do it is by creating a lower, the lowest possible pressure point we can, which is the pump. You need a good functioning pump to get a low pressure point. And we want minimum resistance, no cores, big short hoses, right? Big wide and short hoses. We're gonna leave that there. Um, so any other questions about why? Go ahead. Really, is there an advantage or disadvantage to using two big hoses? So here's where there's the advantage. The advantage is when you're really trying to maximize degassing the oil. So if you're working on a, if you're, if you're, do, it, you're doing a service call, you replace some sort of part inside the system. And now you're gonna pool a vacuum on something that previously had refrigerant in it, right? Like it was operating with refrigerant in it. Now pulling on both sides is advantageous. And a change out, we're only pull, we're not pulling on the condenser, we're not pulling on the compressor. You know, we're pulling on a new evaporator and a line set that we just cleaned, right? So, and again, if you're using flushes, it's gonna take a little longer. Because when you're using flushes, you're also evaporating the flush out. So you're actually dealing with getting that flush boiled out and you're pulling that out of the system. Um, but in that particular case, it's more advantageous to have the micro engage on the other side of the system. When you pull with two hoses, now you've got that same effect where you're not, and the micro engage isn't on the furthest point. And so you're gonna see a number jump down real quick, but if you valve it off, it'll jump right back up. So you have to kind of do that dance before you actually hit the number that you're looking for. Does that make sense? Because now you've got it teed off. And so that's why I don't like, even, even if you have two hoses, I don't like using it on changeouts. Um, installers, it's just an easier process to use the one hose. It's like hose, pump. I've got no T's, I've got no trees, I've got no manifolds, I've got no leak points, I've got, it's really, really straightforward. Um, the next thing that I do advise, for those of you who are struggling, because sometimes when you've got older hoses or whatever, a little dab of nylog can help on the threads and everything in order to help tighten it up a little bit so you don't get as much jumping around. The only downside to nylog is it's sticky and it'll get sand in it and dirt in it and everything else. So then you have to be really careful to protect the ends of your hoses after you use it. So then you have to have a process for that. Um, that's the only downside. If you don't want to use that, you can just use a little bit of refrigerant oil and that will have a not quite as good of an effect, but it'll have some effect on helping get it tight. Um, so those are the only things you really have to pay attention to. Make sure your hoses have seals in them. Uh, make sure your, your uh, core remover tools aren't leaking. Not all core remover tools are the same. Those are the, those are the issues that most people run into. When people say it doesn't work or it adds time, it's usually because you're missing one of the steps. It's almost like if you miss one of the steps, you might as well miss all of the steps. Like if you're going to leave a core remover in, I mean, you know, like you're not going to get the, you're not, you're going to barely get any benefit out of this because you can only pull through a CRT core remover with standard size hoses. You can only pull a half of a CFM. So if you have a six CFM pump, you're not, it's not doing you any good. You might as well have a one CFM pump because you can only pull half a CFM through that. When you get and you're pulling through uh, one hose right to the pump, you can pull five CFM through, estimated about five CFM. When you go to double hoses, that's where you can get up to like 10, 12 CFM. And that's where in service, that's handy because now you're trying to get that refrigerant out of the oil. Does that make sense? Did I lose you guys there? Seeing some blank faces. I think it's the I think it's the KFC. <laughs> I think I think it's the KFC. Go ahead. I'll say, so I I got the one hose set up and I was doing service and uh, and I hardly did any installs and so it, it was hard for me to see. I would get down to like 1,000 microns and it would just sit there forever and so. Um, but I've been doing a lot more installs recently and it is really true. Like just one hose on a new system. 30 minutes. Yeah. 30 minutes. And then I just got a second hose um, and I did a, a compressor and, uh, and it was probably 45 minutes and I was under 500 microns. Yeah. Um, so it, it does work, but yeah, it's like, it's, it, it's just like there are some kinks you have to kind of figure out. But you just knowing why it's stalling is key. Yeah. It's, it's stalling fun. mostly because refrigerant's in the oil. Yeah. It's not, and that's not really that big of a deal. Releasing a charge, okay, so here's, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna commit heresy right now, okay? If you're working on service 
and you replaced a part inside the system, and you put a new liquid line dryer in it, and you use the processes that I'm telling you to use, and it's stalling out at 1,200 microns. That's well below the boiling point of water. You do not have, you do not have liquid water in the system at that point. Check your sight glass on your pump. You know your pump's working. It's not creamy. You know you look for creamy oil in the sight glass. All that, and you're getting, you're stalling out at 1,200 microns. Just, just go. Like release the charge, you know, charge it and go. You're, you're fine. That's not a big deal. Um, you're not, you, you have hardly anything in that system. It's just taking forever. Now again, my guess is the reason it's stalling on you though is you didn't do the nitrogen purge the way I told you. That's fine. It, for you guys, that's fine. What time? What time is it going? Yeah. Twelve minutes. Again, half of you aren't even using micron gauges right now. So, so let's be real honest. Like, let's not. Again, the, the line that I really like, there's a guy, um, his name is Russ King, and he, he runs a, a company called Quick Model where they, you can do 3D designs and ductwork. And his phrase is, we're so busy splitting hairs when we should be shaving heads, right? And that's a really, really good line. Some of you here don't even need to shave your head anymore, I don't think. I'm not naming any names. But, uh, I just, <laughs> <laughs> no, but the, the, the term means that like basically if you're getting down to 1,200, 1,500 in that range, you're getting into that range, you're well below the point where you're contaminated with water anymore. Like you're in, go you're in good shape. It's just you've got some molecules that are still making their way out of the oil, okay? Now, if you purge nitrogen first and in certain cases you use heat right so if you're pulling if you're pulling on a compressor especially and you can use some heat on the compressor yeah, that'll really speed it up big time use a heat gun if you can energize the crankcase heater um, if it's got a crankcase you guys probably don't have crankcase heaters down here very often do you uh, are they? if you do if you do you can energize just the crankcase heater and that'll heat it up pretty quick and that'll help you drive that moisture out of the oil because um, that's what's doing it guaranteed if you're pulling on a compressor, that's what's doing it. Compressor just takes forever to get that out. And it's also hard, because even when you put nitrogen in, you can't flow through the compressor. It's like you're pressurizing and depressurizing. You're not gonna push nitrogen through those compressor valves. So, um, but again, follow those processes. If you get a little stuck and it's stalling on you and you're down there and your oil's clean and all that and you got a micron gauge on it, you did all this, okay, fine. You know, you're, you're okay, don't, don't get too worked up about it. It's on install that I really, really care about it. That's where, if I was gonna start anywhere with you guys, I wouldn't even focus on service right now. I would focus on install, get the one hose, get the micron gauge, get that process in place, because that doesn't just solve the problem of clean, dry, and tight, or, or clean and dry, it also solves the issue of tight. It helps you ensure that you're not leaving leaks, which that's a big deal on install. That's say, I mean, leaks cost a lot of money uh, if you leave them on install. And I don't know that you guys have a problem with that necessarily, but it's just a good part of the process. Right, correct. Right. Or fifteen thousand. You know? <laughs> like no, I'm not kidding. I mean like it's it's a, it's seven hundred atmospheric pressure is seven hundred and sixty thousand microns. Right? That's what we're sitting at now. That gives you an idea of how far away we are from deep vacuum. Right? So if you get down to fifteen hundred versus seven hundred and sixty thousand, you're doing pretty good. Right now, if you guys are doing the listening to the pump thing you may be getting down to 20,000 microns and, and thinking it's good, and that's not good. Um, 1,500 is fine. Go ahead. So if you start doing a different method where you can actually see it, especially if you use the one hose, and you can see you can, what's written on the gate is more accurate. If you're not doing it, the gate test, it can probably look, it doesn't look as important. That's why you want to the gate test is important. Correct. Yeah. You start doing this because you really realize that you're not going to Right, right. And, that is what, and that's, what I, that's the path I took. So this was in 2005. Um, we, nobody had micro engages. Um, I mean, we were lucky if guys were even pulling vacuums half the time. And then 410A came out, PoE oil. This is how I know the difference. We put in the first couple PoE systems in new construction, and they were just blowing compressor terminals out right and left. Like, it was happening that quick because we realized that the installers were pushing line sets without even sealing the ends, and this is underground. So they were pushing underground line sets through PVC, through line sets that were full of water, and they were just filling these suckers up with water. And in the past, with 22, who knows, they were probably failing in two years, but with POE, they were failing like that. They would just blast oil out. So I was like, okay, I know, I know how to do this, and I was smart, I had read the books, 
oh yeah, I'm gonna get a micro engage. So I got micro engages and started trying to do it and it just wasn't working. Like we had the old Robin Air micro engages where the lights would go off as it got down to deeper vacuum. I think they still sell the things. And it would never even make it, the first light would never even go off. I was like, you know, and so I thought, the, I thought the gauges were broken. So I went back to the rep and I'm like, these, these gauges are broken, they don't work. And at that time, nobody knew how to do it right. We were actually pulling vacuum through the gauge. And so their solution was, yeah, I'd mount the gauge right on the pump and then it works better. Well, of course it does because <laughs> now I'm just measuring what the vacuum is of the pump. I'm like, oh, it's great. And then we were trying to do hold tests, decay tests, nothing was holding. So we eventually just gave up on it. Like we didn't, until I you know, learned about a lot of this lost information, which Jim Bergman and the guys from Appian and all those uh, taught us. Uh, and and you know, now we understand how it works. But it's the same thing around here. If you start doing it, you're gonna realize, oh crap, like this isn't actually going great but then you'll figure it out. Uh, and then in the end, you'll end up getting better results. And the end result will be the systems you install last longer. Now, you're in this salt environment, you know, so is it as big of a deal as some places, because these units probably have a hard time lasting 10 years as it is, is it as big of a deal? Maybe not, and that's okay for you to make those judgment calls, but you wanna make those with information, not with lack of information, right? You don't wanna be the reason why people's units aren't, aren't holding up, right? Make sense? Go ahead. So, so it sounds like the difference is, and then when you're saying install and service work is because the condenser is off and off, that's what makes the difference. Correct. Correct. The oil, again, when refrigerant is present with oil, um, that oil picks up the refrigerant. It entrains that refrigerant and holds it, and it doesn't release it easy. And again, that's not a scientific explanation, uh, but I know for a fact that happens, and you can see it. Like I mentioned, when we're pulling these vacuums in commercial applications, you can actually watch the, the refrigerant boiling out of the oil in the sight glasses. Um, so it just, it hangs onto it. And it's even worse with modern, with PoE oil, it's worse. When, when the compressor terminals blow, the moisture builds up? Yeah, so there's an arc. There's an arc flash right behind that terminal. Because if you've ever looked at, um, it's really weird. If you've ever done a cutaway on a compressor, when you take it open, literally, there's, there's that glass fusite little orange plug and those are just studs that go through that. So there's connectors on the outside and there's connectors on the inside that connect to those studs, like the same, same, same. And so when, there's an, when eventually it eats up and there's an arc there, it'll actually you know, create a little mini explosion and it'll, it'll just blow out. <laughs> yeah. 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 And again, there's actually a unit. One of the things we're going to do is we're going to go do a uh, a group uh, a diagnosis on this condenser that's sitting out back that that caught on fire out the side. And my guess is that's probably what happened. Um, a terminal venting situation, but we'll we'll talk about it together and come up with some hypotheses. Um, but that is, but what you said is actually not false. There have been some cases of um, false, fake refrigerant that had propane in it coming in from overseas. That's the thing. And my guess is you guys, because of your lack of regulation, you can probably direct import um, from China. Is that is that true? Can you direct import refrigerant? Yeah. Um, like I tried to do, I didn't know the rules one time and I went on Alibaba and I was like, look at how cheap 410A is. I can just, I can just get it straight from China. And, and I was talking to somebody, they're like, yeah, yeah, no, they'll ship it to you. And then when you get to the port, they'll arrest you and throw you in prison. I'm like, oh, okay, I guess I won't do that then. Yeah. Yeah. And fire it up with nitrogen in it. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that is, a, that is a thing, dry ship units, yeah. Yeah, right, yep. Dry ship units were, was a thing, and especially... Oh, yeah. Yeah, I know your head pressure will go really, really high. Um, yeah, it's, yeah, you do not want any nitrogen in the system. Nitrogen, of the things that you could have in there, it's one of the least... At least it isn't going to like ruin anything, um, but it, yeah, it'll totally mess up your pressures and your head pressure will be sky high. Uh, you've got no choice but to start over, so. Cool. Any other questions that I saw? Go ahead, Octavia. I have a question. 
but I wanted to say we had a place where we received uh, was like pack one people egg, and so every other time we didn't have the refrigerant tester yet. So we were told that if you take K light and you take out the liquid and if it burns, the K light is back. And so we had quite a lot we received and we turned it back and it went through the government and it was sent back. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I, like I've heard, I've never personally seen it. I've never personally seen it, but I have heard of it, and especially in more unregulated um, areas, so they'll, yeah, send it in. Because again, like as an example, propane is an amazing refrigerant. Like you can put propane in an R22 system, it'll work great. The problem is it's dangerous, you know, and it'll, you know, blow your face off. But um, yeah. It's, it, it is something we need to watch for, for sure. And uh, that, yeah, that may be something to, something to do more of. Uh, what else? Gilbert, you had something? Yeah. Um, why does the bus smoke, uh, smoke like exhaust? Yeah, so that's actually, that smoke that you're seeing is actually condensation. It's actually discharging water vapor. So especially that early, because again, even if the system has no liquid water in it whatsoever, it still has a lot of water. There's water vapor in the air. So when that initially comes out, that's what you're seeing is water vapor, yeah. So when it stops smoking, that's when everything... Uh, well, that's when it's likely that you have removed all of the water vapor, or at least most of the water vapor. You're still going to have some molecules ping-ponging around in there, but yeah, most of the water vapor. Do you think people like the propane uh, system could blow up because of the friction? Uh, not just not if it does not have um, oxygen present. And so this is actually kind of another important thing to mention. If you've seen, if you've watched some videos where the guy will be working on a unit and then all of a sudden the unit's not there, there's a flash and he's not there anymore, um, like it happens. I mean, people get totally blown up. And that happens because of something called diesel effect where you have uh, a flammable refrigerant present with oxygen together in the compressor. So that compressor, again, if it doesn't have oxygen present, there's not really a way for it to combust. Um, it can combust once it leaks out, and now it starts to burn But while it's in there. But it's when you don't pull a good vacuum and you have a flammable refrigerant that it becomes more of a factor, which is another reason why pulling good vacuums as we get more and more flammable refrigerants. Like I said, you guys are going to be working on R32 in the next six months. Uh, assuredly, you will be. Um, they're just manufacturers are going to start shipping it to you, and that is a more flammable refrigerant than 410A. Uh, for, a lot of people don't know this, but 410A is actually half R32. It's 50% R32, 50% R125. 125, yeah. Yeah. All right, fun. Keep going. Um, this just talks about the decay test, what you look for. And again, that's where we say uh, pulling below, again, we say, we say at Kalos, below uh, 300. We try to get it to 200, hold it for at least 10 minutes. That's standard. Um, like I said, carrier standard, which they still have in a lot of their literature, is pull below 500 or pull to 500 and hold uh, to below 1,000 in a 10-minute period of time. So uh, if, you're, if you're doing it this way, you're going to be, you're gonna be uh, better than what the uh, industry requires. And again, whatever you guys come up with in terms of your own process, any process is going to be better than no process. Um, and, I, and I encourage people to not be too overly... Again, I'm the guy who tells people all this stuff that sounds so extreme to everyone, but just remember, I have to say that publicly because you have to, like, you know, I have to put that out there. In more private conversations, do what works for you so long as you know you're not going to, um, you're going to give your client a good product, good end product. Thanks for watching. If you're willing, give this video a thumbs up and drop us a comment. Don't forget to hit that bell icon to stay updated with all of our future videos. And as a quick reminder, HVAC School isn't just a YouTube channel. Dive deeper with us at our main website, HVACRschool.com. Curious for more knowledge on the go? We've got you covered. Tune into the HVAC School podcast, available on all your favorite podcast apps. And while you're at it, join our thriving Facebook group. Also, don't miss out on our free mobile applications, available for both iPhone and Android. We're all about community. Vortex by Tex.